Right, I want to turn now to start looking more directly at the problems which led to the ultimate downfall of logical positivism. Um, I'm not going to complete them here. I'll continue to talk about those problems when I get to the next video where I talk about the problem of induction and the problem of confirmation. But I at least want to start looking at the down, what was the real downfall um, of, of logical positivism. And it, uh, just let's start with problems with the verifiability theory of meaning. Now, according to the verifiability of theory of meaning, much language is actually meaningless. So things like poetry and ethics and theology don't really seem to be verifiable in the way that the logical positivists insisted. Now, the positivists themselves had no problem with this. They, they accepted it, they bit this bullet, and they, they even embraced it, actually. They thought it was actually sort of a good thing. They thought, yes, a lot of th this sort of talk about, about ethics and right and wrong and the categorical imperative and so forth and, and, and theology and God and even poetry. This stuff is basically just gibberish. Um, you know, if, if it has any value, it's only, you know, uh, uh, in, in some sort of abstract way. It's certainly not scientifically legitimate, uh, and it certainly doesn't rise to the level of what we want to call knowledge, uh, no matter how sort of insightful the poetry we might be, no matter how committed we feel to these ethical principles, or no matter how profound the, the theological ideas might be, they're ultimately unverifiable, hence ultimately meaningless, and we should uh, discard this sort of talk. Well, that might not be a big problem then, but notice this. We can actually jerry-rig meaningless statements in order to make them testable. So consider the following statement. Water is blue, and absolute spirit is perfect. That seems like the kind of statement that we want to say is ultimately meaningless because of that whole stuff about the you know, absolute spirit being perfect. That, that's something we want to say. It's unverifiable and it's garbage, so we should throw it out. But actually, this is a testable statement because if we can test the first part, then we are testing the statement as a whole. If it turns out that A is false, then A and B must be false too. So while part of the statement is senseless, another part of it is... Uh, actually very meaningful and very testable. And there's no logical reason why we should have to divide this up. Uh, so, so again, the, the logic here states that, it, that this statement is at least a, test, a testable one. And that means that it's, at least in principle, a meaningful statement. And that's kind of an uncomfortable position for the, for, for the positivists. Um, now, the positivists tried to sort of fix these problems, uh, but they ended up really only sort of digging themselves in deeper and deeper. Uh, every solution that they came up to, problem, uh, to these sorts of problems ended up just giving rise to more problems. Here is uh, another one. This is uh, another problem. It's called the problem of reflexivity. Can we verify the verifiability theory of meaning? What evidence, what experience would we use to prove that the verifiability theory of meaning uh, is, is the right theory of meaning? And, well, you know, just to cut to the chase, it doesn't seem like there is any theory of meaning or any way to verify the verifiability theory of meaning. It ends up being a snake that eats its own tail. It, it sort of collapses. Now, again, I don't mean to suggest that the positives had no responses to these problems. They, they, they did. But, like I say, they couldn't really agree amongst themselves as to what the best way to respond to these issues were. And every time they came up with something that had any sort of promise, it just made things more complicated. So the real issue, though, what, what, what probably was, you know, the maybe not the beginning of the end, but uh, perhaps even better, the end of the end of, of the positivist movement, was an article by Willard Van Orman Quine, American philosopher, uh, called Two Dogmas of Empiricism. And this article is just a game changer. It is a classic of modern philosophy. Many people actually will say this is the single most important article in 20th century philosophy. Um, and even if it's not the most important, it's definitely at the top. It's, it, it, it's huge important and anyone who's seriously interested uh, in, in 20th century philosophy should, should, should read and study two dogmas very very closely. So a little background sort of on, on Quine's approach here before getting into the details. Quine thought that both testing and meaning were holistic in nature. That is to say that you cannot test ideas in isolation. When you test one idea, you test every other idea that is connected to that idea. Quick example, let's say we're performing a test of a, a scientific hypothesis. I hypothesize X, and we get a result that we didn't expect. Let's say that we expected X, to, to, that we'd find results X, and we, and we don't find result X. Does that mean that X is false? Not necessarily. Uh, maybe we miscalibrated our instruments. 
Maybe we're relying on a sort of faulty piece of background knowledge. Maybe we didn't, uh, maybe we had a contaminated sample or something like that. So in, we're not just testing hypothesis X when we perform an experiment. We're also testing a whole bunch of other assumptions that go along with that. We're, we're, we're testing the idea that we've calibrated our instruments, that we're not using a contaminated sample. And if we get a, uh, an answer that we didn't anticipate, it might not be the hypothesis that's mistaken. It might be one of these auxiliary assumptions that turns out to be wrong. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, yeah, okay, but well, then there's a way to, to test these auxiliary hypotheses. We can, uh, we can double check our calibration of our instruments. We can uh, go back and try a separate sample that we, we, we've examined more closely and we know isn't contaminated and so forth. Um, but if you're thinking that, then you're really not using your imagination here. It, there are so many po other sorts of auxiliary hypotheses that come in somewhere along the line. There's simply no practical way that we can ever test all of them. We can never isolate it down to just the hypothesis. All these other auxiliary issues will always be on the table. We're testing them as well. And any time we get a result we don't anticipate, we can't just assume it's the hypothesis that's wrong. It, m it might be in an auxiliary issue. And that's what, the, the, you know, what holism is all about. When we test, we're testing a whole web of ideas, not just a single idea. So let's turn now then to the first dogma of empiricism. And this is what we talked about before, the analytic synthetic distinction. Quine claimed that there is no scientific way to make sense of the analytic synthetic distinction. And this basically follows directly from his idea of holism about testing. If in fact, when we perform a test, we're not just testing a hypothesis, but we're testing every idea that connects to that hypothesis, then when we're, we're performing a test, we're also testing our analytic beliefs as well. We're testing ideas that, according to the positivists, we're supposed to be immune from experience, immune from empirical testing. Quine actually thinks that analytic beliefs are subject to revision. They're subject to falsification if we get the right results in, in our testing. So the, the Quine's uh, phrase here, which is a phrase I've used in my videos before, is this idea of a web of beliefs. Our, uh, our beliefs are all connected in this sort of nebulous way. I have a graphic right here that sort of gives you the idea. Each one of these little nodes is a belief, and they all tie together. And so I've, I've labeled one here my belief that water is blue, and that's tied into my experience about what water is, what the color blue is, and so forth and so on, how light works, how wavelengths work. All that stuff sort of clusters together. And when I'm testing a, a hypothesis like water is blue, I'm not just testing that. I'm testing every other node that this idea is connected to. And if I get you know something uh, uh, other other than blue, I might revise one of my other hypotheses. I might revise the idea that what I'm looking at is water. I might revise the idea that uh, my eyes are working properly. So any one of these other parts of the web of belief might end up being revised. And indeed, even analytic statements might end up being revised. It'd be pretty radical, of course, for this to happen, but it's not unprecedented. Uh, in 20th century science, for example, we've got good reasons to think that uh, again, Euclidean geometry, which was uh, so obvious to Rene Descartes that it was rationally undeniable. Uh, if, if, if you forget your sort of you know, your middle school geometry here, Euclidean geometry uh, against the geometry of Euclid was outlined in ancient Greece. It involved. It's based on five Euclidean postulates that say things like parallel lines never meet. Uh, for any line and a point, there's precisely one line that crosses through that point and the and the line at a right angle. These things look intuitively obvious, but it turns out that the universe that we actually live in is non-Euclidean in nature. It's not actually true of the universe that parallel lines never meet. That, that might seem strange to some of you, but I promise you it's true. There are, in the universe, parallel lines actually can cross if they, for example, go uh, past a, a supermassive black hole. The space will warp around them, and, the, and, and, and these two lines can actually cross. But, and here's the mind-blowing part, those ideas, excuse me, those lines are still parallel. So Euclidean geometry, which was, again, which was thought to be analytically true, true by definition, has been revised in the 20th century. Schrodinger's cat, I've made a video on Schrodinger's cat before, is another idea which actually seems subject to revision, uh, me, which makes us revise something that we previously thought was a logical absolute, the law of excluded middle. This is the idea that anything is either X or not X. It can't be, can't be both at the same time. So the, the, the example the idea here is that, that a cat in a box is either dead or not dead. It can't be both. But according to you know one popular interpretation of quantum mechanics, uh, it actually is true that a cat 
can be in what's called a superposition. It can be simultaneously dead and not dead, simultaneously alive and dead at the same time. Um, now, these are there's there's controversy over this interpretation of quantum mechanics. You can check out my earlier video. I'll post a link to it if you want to check it out. Um, but again, the, the idea here is not so much to, 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 to defend the Copenhagen interpretation, but just to show that it's not impossible to revise our analytic beliefs. We actually can say, you know, maybe rather than throwing out this experimental result, we should throw out this analytic idea of the law of excluded middle or this analytic idea of Euclidean geometry. So, um, Quine is on pretty solid scientific grounds here when he says that we actually do sometimes, rare circumstances, but nonetheless sometimes, test our analytic beliefs. And that, you know, or at least what we, we typically think of as analytic beliefs. And so, but if we're testing them, then they're not true by definition. They are true, at least in part, because of how the world is. And that means the analytic synthetic distinction collapses. So, um, this is a real problem for logical positives. I could go on to the second dogma, but I actually want to move on to another part, uh, another school of criticism of logical positivism. Uh, and this is something that comes from, uh, from not a Quinean approach, but from another approach entirely. Recall that quote that I, uh, that I gave from Heraclitus in the very beginning of my, my History of Science lectures. Uh, the idea that nature loves to hide. Lots of people like this idea. They like the idea that science doesn't just describe experience. It describes nature itself. Science isn't the study of experience. It's the study of nature. It's the study of reality. And science gives us the sort of final word on the nature of reality, the nature of the world. Um, now, this, this view is a view called scientific realism. This is the idea that science talks about the hidden structures of the world, uh, the, 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 the structure that's sort of beneath our sense experiences. Logical positivism is obligated to deny scientific realism. It has to say scientific realism is false. It has to say that science does not tell us about the fundamental structure of nature because all science can tell us about is our experiences. This is again, just uh, the revised problem of, of, uh, of uh, external world skepticism that we talked about before. Uh, now, logical empiricism, which was, a, like I said, the sort of milder offshoot of logical positivism, you know, more popular in, in, in the 60s, um, it wanted to avoid this problem, uh, and it tried to do it by sort of trying to sort of trying to accommodate this idea that when, again, when we talk about electrons, we're not just talking about patterns of experience, we're talking about something that's really real in the atomic structure uh, of, of matter. It really is there. It's not just a pattern of experience. It's a part of what's really going on. They wanted to capture this, but ultimately they ended up just sort of contradicting the fundamental empiricist principles that they were, were, were based on. Um, so the positivists had resisted that there were depths in nature. There are no hidden depths there is no hidden structure to nature. There is only surface. There is only experience. There is only the way the world appears to be. And this is deeply unsatisfying for a lot of people. Now, maybe we can throw out scientific realism. Maybe we can, we're comfortable being anti-realists about science. Maybe we can find ways around problems with the verifiability theory of meaning. Maybe we can come up with responses to Quine. Um, but I hope you get the idea here. Positivism is starting to die the death of a thousand cuts. Um, the objections just sort of pile up and pile up and pile up. They come from psychology. They come from linguistics. Uh, they come from a whole host of fields, which, which just basically sort of say that the way positivism describes science just can't work. Um, so all of these objections build up. And like I say, I'm not done talking about it. I'll talk about more in the next video. They pile up um, and they bring down logical positivism. It, it's about as close to a completely rejected theory as any idea in the history of science has ever, in the history of philosophy, has ever come to. Now, that's not to say that the positivists were completely full of shit or they were, or they were totally wrong or anything like that. Their ideas still obviously have some value, and some of what they had to say will be preserved in theories that I'll talk about in future lectures. But at the same time, the core contentions of empiricism, of logical positivism, that is, um, is something that, that uh, we, we, we can't really uh, hold on to anymore. So the, the lessons to be learned here is that there, while empiricism, there's obviously something true about empiricism in general, um, 
we we should be acknowledge that there are limit limitations to empiricism. We should shift from sometimes what's called capital E empiricism to lowercase e empiricism, sort of a less ambitious sort of empiricism, the details of which we can't sketch out here. We shouldn't be so overconfident. We should exercise more caution. One real problem with the positivists, uh, as with a lot of philosophers in history, is they got too big for their britches. They assumed that they really had it all figured out, that their theory was the end-all be-all, um, and it was going to continue on throughout the ages. That just didn't happen. Uh, uh, so whatever we end up subscribing to, let's try to sort of embrace some Socratic humility uh, and not assume that we have all the answers worked out.